Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Frederick Douglass Initiative at Edinburgh University. I'm joined today by Dr. Tyrone Freeman, uh, who is our keynote for today, our special featured guest speaker, and Dr. Kavan Bruce, who is also the co-chair of the Frederick Douglass Initiative at Edinburgh University, and also a, a professor in the counseling program. Again, we're so excited to have you join us today. Our talk today is on Madam C.J. Walker, an icon in African-American history. And we're gonna have uh, a, a discussion for a presentation from Dr. Freeman that helps us to understand the works that she's done and how she's contributed um, to the rich history in uh, uh, African-American culture. Um, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kavan Bruce. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. All right, so I'm gonna start off with doing a biography uh, introduction to Dr. Freeman. So Tyrone McKinley Freeman is an award-winning scholar and teacher who serves as an associate professor of philanthropic studies and also the director of undergraduate programs at Indiana University. Previously, he was a professional fundraiser for the social services, community development, and higher education organizations. He was also associate director of the fundraising school where he trained nonprofit leaders in the United States, Africa, Asia, and Europe. His research is focused on the history of African-American philanthropy, philanthropy in communities of color, the history of American philanthropy, and phil philanthropy and fundraising higher education. <laughs> and the reason why we're here today, his book, Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel of Giving, Black Women's Philanthropy During Jim Crow, is the book that examines African-American women's history of charitable giving, activism, and education, and the provision of life and the example of Madam C.J. Walker, who was an early 20th century Black philanthropist and entrepreneur. If you're familiar with him, you'll know that his work has appeared and been cited in O, the Oprah Magazine, Time, BBC News, Newsweek, News One, The Conversation, Black Perspectives, Chronicle of Philanthropy, and Stanford Social Innovation Review, just to name a few. And he's also the co-author of Race, Gender, and Leadership in Nonprofit Organizations. And I would hate to forget to mention that he is a proud graduate of an HBCU. So he earned his BA in English and Liberal Arts from D. Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. He has an MS in Adult Education from Indiana University a second master's in urban and regional planning from Ball State University, and he has a PhD in philanthropic studies from Indiana University. And without further ado, Dr. Freeman, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bruce, for that introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here, uh, spending some time with you today, so thank you very much for your time and attention, and I have to give a shout out to Dr. Dixon for making this possible. Uh, we met last fall at the Nonprofit Partnership Conference and had a wonderful time together there, and so i um, delighted to be back with uh, the community here now today to talk more about Madam C.J. Walker. And so uh, I'm going to begin by uh, sharing my screen. I have a few things to, to go along with, with our, our discussion here today. And our plan is that I'm going to share some things with you, some themes from the book, um, and then we're going to go into a, a conversation, Dr. Bruce and I, and, and some Q&A with you. But I want to revisit this familiar figure, Madam C.J. Walker, um, who many of you will know as a hair care mogul, a woman who was named the first self-made female millionaire in American history. Um, and so she's known for these important things, but I wanted to revisit her through a different lens, and that is the lens of philanthropy through generosity and giving. And so that's what we're going to do today. And in the process, we're going to learn a lot about African-American philanthropy and the ways in which Black people have been generous throughout their history. And so I want to start with a little background on the book. Um, I, I wrote this book because I'm the son, grandson, nephew, and cousin of African-American Baptist preachers and first ladies. And this is here, me with my parents and my grandmother. Uh, you know, So I grew up in the Black Baptist Church, which is a philanthropic institution. Um, everyone around me was constantly giving caring, sharing, engaging. Uh, but you know, they never once used the word philanthropy to describe what they were doing. And yet they were generous to the core. And so I grew up in this tradition and was surrounded by these givers. And yet years later, when I entered into the professional world of fundraising, uh, I found myself regularly one of the only African Americans in the room, but in a field that was dedicated to giving and generosity, but didn't know anything or much about African American philanthropy. 
and years later, when I began working on my PhD, uh, and, and which is in philanthropy, and I'm reading the so-called canon of the great theory and theories and theorists, I'm not seeing serious engagement with Black people as philanthropists and the idea that Black people give to. And so um, I wrote this book to bridge the gap between my lived experience of growing up in the tradition and my ex professional experiences in the world of philanthropy and to, to fill that gap. So what I call Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel of Giving is my effort to articulate her philanthropy philosophy of giving. That is why she gave, how she gave, what she gave, but perhaps most importantly, the context in which she gave. And to set that context for you, I'm going to need a little help from another famous figure in our history, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, in 1909, Du Bois wrote this, few races are more instinctively philanthropic than the Negro. It is shown in everyday life and in their group history. Some few of their larger philanthropies in America in early days have been recorded. Uh, I remember Du Bois is the first African-American to graduate from Harvard with a PhD. Uh, he's no casual observer, right? And it turns out in 1909, he published a national study on Black philanthropy. And let's remember the context for 1909. Uh, we're we're, we're four, four or five decades removed from emancipation from slavery when four million newly free people stepped out of their shackles and into freedom. We're also three decades removed from the end of Reconstruction, which was those 12 years in which African Americans were free and America was for its first time a biracial democracy. Uh, but there were angry white Southerners who resented this black freedom and literally rose up and took their country back, leaving behind what came to be known as Jim Crow in its wake. We're also about a decade removed from the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision which codified Jim Crow as the law of the land. And in this context, Du Bois writes, few races are more instinctively philanthropic. It's important to understand this because this is also the context for Madam C.J. Walker. She lived during this, this time period. So she was born in 1867 as Sarah Breedlove on a cotton plantation in Delta, Louisiana. Uh, and her entire family had been enslaved, but she was the first freeborn member. Uh, but life quickly turned tragic. By the age of seven, both of her parents had died. Uh, she became under the care of her older sister. Uh, she started working around the age of 10 or 11 as a washerwoman, uh, and then she met married in her preteens. She had a child um, in her middle teens, but then tragedy struck again. Her husband died, and now it's just her and her little daughter. Uh, she's, she's a single mother. She's uneducated because there's no provisions for Black education in her community. And also, she's a bit of a homeless migrant. As Jim Crow is being constructed around her and life is becoming more and more troubling, uh, she begins moving around the South, seeking some opportunity and seeking safety. And of course, she, all this is happening to her as a Black woman before she turns 22 in this newly emerging Jim Crow America. It was a devastating life, a very difficult start to life. But the story quickly changes. She makes her way to St. Louis uh, in her early 20s with her young daughter in tow. And there she not only reunites with some of her brothers who are there with the barbershop, but she also gets connected to a local community through the St. Paul's African, um, uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church, which still exists to this day. Uh, and, and this church had established a network of organizations that was helping Black people like, like, like Sarah, and it was funding it and making opportunities available to the newly arriving migrants. And so the story progresses, and we don't have a lot of time to get into it, but she holds down different jobs. She eventually starts working in beauty culture and comes up with a, uh, a recipe for some products. She puts her face and her name on it after marrying a man named Charles Joseph Walker. So that's where the Madam C.J. Walker comes from. Starts selling them door to door. Um, the story picks up when she um, moves to Indianapolis in 1910, formally sets up the headquarters for the company, uh, and kind of the rest is history. She becomes this household name. The products are used around the country and overseas, and her story culminates in 1919, uh, in this 34 room, $250,000 mansion in Irvington, New York, where a nearby neighbor is Mr. John D. Rockefeller. Uh, that, my friends, is not supposed to happen. That was not Jim Crow's plan for Black life, and yet Madam Walker did it anyway. And what I was interested in is that the philanthropy that she engaged in, the active behaviors and activities of helping others, did not begin in this mansion after she had had it made, she after she had all this wealth, but actually it was something that started much earlier in her life when she was a poor, orphan, struggling, widowed young mother. And that's the story that I wanted to pursue uh, in the archive. And so I began to do the research. 
Madam Walker's papers are here at the Indiana Historical Society. Uh, several hundred boxes of, of items and information is going through to try to understand the origins and motivations for her giving to help others and, and what it was all about. And so uh, in the process of going through the papers, I needed ways to think about and, and understand what I was seeing, the documentation and, and the stories and things that were emerging. And so I was reading widely in the history of American philanthropy, looking for Madam C.J. Walker and a way to make sense of what I was seeing in the archive. But guess what, my friends? She's not there. This history and these historians are very much focused on the wealthy white men who established businesses and created wealth the world had never seen before and then created philanthropic foundations, which changed the nature of philanthropy as we had understood it up until that time. People like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. So this literature was no help. So then I went to the history of women's philanthropy looking for Madam C.J. Walker. But guess what, my friends? She's not there. This history and these writers are very much focused on the wives, daughters, and sisters of the wealthy white men who created wealth the world had never seen before and set up philanthropic foundations and, and began to change the way we thought about philanthropy. So it was no help. I said, well, if these two fields had not engaged Madam C.J. Walker, then surely the small but growing field of African-American philanthropy will have examined her. But guess what? She's not there. This field and these writers are focused on the institutions of Black philanthropy rather than the individuals. So there's lots written about the Black church, about fraternities and sororities, and about club, uh, women's clubs and other organizations, but doesn't really lift up individuals or understand them as actors in this tradition. So it, it didn't have Madam Walker, but it began to point me in the right direction. And then when I got to Black women's history, well, it turns out that Black women's historians have been writing about Madam Walker and her peers for generations. And so uh, they were very much engaged in her story, but they had not engaged her as a philanthropist. And so I had found my opening to understand what was going on. And so I found a moment in the archive that opened up Madam Walker's philanthropy. And it comes from 1914, when Madam Walker's having a series of letters and conversations with Booker T. Washington, whom you will remember was the founder of Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, Tuskegee University in Alabama. He also, in this time period, is, is a leading African-American figure in politics and education. He has the ear of the white political elites of his time. He also has the pocketbooks of the white philanthropic elites of his time. He's a controversial figure, and yet Madam Walker really appreciates him and his work. She wants to support the things that he's doing at Tuskegee, and so she's talking to him about making a gift of $300 to support five students at, at the university. And they go back and forth and they're about to kind of execute the gift and get it just right. And Booker T. Washington does something. He asked her if she could give more. Well, why did he do that, my friends? This really upset Madam Walker because to her, it felt like a rejection of her hard-earned resources. And so she sat down and proceeded to write him a letter in which she thoroughly told him about himself. She goes on and said, well, why are you changing your tune here? We've been talking about this gift. I'm about to make it. And now you're saying it's not, it's not enough. Uh, will it help? I hope I'm not missing my mark. I want to be helpful to you, but you've got to work with me. I want to give you thousands of dollars, but right now in this moment, I can only give you hundreds, right? Then she hits him with this statement. I am unlike your white friends who have waited until they were rich and then help, but have in proportion to my success, I have reached out and am helping others. When I saw this, my friends, I cracked a big smile because I knew exactly what she was talking about. So let me break it down for you. Who were Washington's white friends? Well, for starters, there's Andrew Carnegie, the famous steel magnate of this era, right? He is known for putting forth this model of philanthropy where you spend your life accumulating wealth and then in old age become focused on philanthropy, and begin giving the away and redistributing those resources, right? And, and so it's a very popular model and it's a model that's behind some of the, the people who are primarily associated with philanthropy today, like, like Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett. You spend your life accumulating wealth and then later, you give it away. But here's Madam Walker saying, I'm not Andrew Carnegie. That's not what I'm doing. I'm giving along the way. I'm giving as I'm able. I'm not waiting until some distant point in the future to engage. I'm trying to help folks right now. So I need you, Mr. Washington, to see me for who I am and stop comparing me to Andrew Carnegie. There's also another leading philanthropist of this era, a woman named Olivia Sage. Now, she was married to a man named Russell Sage, who was a leading Wall Street financier. And in keeping with the Victorian mores of the era, um, she was not able to lead the kind of publicly and civically engaged life that she wanted to outside the home. But after her husband died and she inherited millions of dollars from him, um, she began to give and engage in, uh, through her philanthropy in ways that are still legendary to this day and reverberate 
operate down to uh, us today. Uh, she opened up universities for women. Uh, she funded the environment. She fell into the development of, of fields like social work and social sciences, a very consequential giver. And yet here's Madam Walker saying, I'm not Olivia Sage, right? I don't have anyone to inherit money from. I've been in the economy since I was 10 years old, creating these resources that I'm giving away. So don't interact with me the way you interact with Olivia Sage. I'm doing something fundamentally different. I need you to see me for who I am. This is critically important because if the leading white models of philanthropy of her era don't explain Madam C.J. Walker, then which models do? And this is what I wanted to uncover in my book, my friends. So it turns out that Madam Walker, Sarah Breedlove, uh, the woman that we know as this legendary historical figure, in terms of her philanthropy, she was produced by several networks of generous Black women. And I want to take you through each one for a little bit and share a little bit of background before we go into our conversation. So for starters, there were black washerwomen. Uh, and so I told you before that she started working as a washerwoman in her very early teens. And it's something that she always mentioned in her public speeches. She was very proud of having been a washerwoman. And it was backbreaking work. But it turns out that black washerwomen in the post-Reconstruction South were not just menial laborers at the bottom of the economy. No, they were pillars of their community, looked to with respect. They were deeply engaged. They, they participated in mutual aid strategies where they supported each other, would frequently watch each each other's children while they would work. Sometimes they would wash their clients' clothing together to get some, some uh, economies of scale going, but they were also known to give to charity. In fact, uh, one scholar des describes them as the first that people would go to, local organizations would go to when seeking donations. They invested in businesses, and of course, they were providing housing and education for their own families. And so Black washerwomen were incredibly important and generous network of Black women, out of which came uh, the legendary Madam C.J. Walker. And it's important to pay homage and understand understand those community-based traditions of giving in order to understand the philanthropist who became uh, the, the philanthropist that Madam Walker became. The second network was the network of, of Black club women and church women. I mentioned before that when she went arrived in St. Louis in 1889 in her early 20s with her young daughter in tow, she was greeted by this church, St. Paul's African Methodist Episcopal Church. And St. Paul's, as I mentioned, had set up this social safety net for arriving Black migrants like Sarah. And it had a school attached to it and an orphanage providing daycare services and lots of other social services designed to help Black folks um, either get settled in St. Louis or or rest up as they prepared to head westward um, in some of the early migrations during this uh, period in history. But one of the things that was important here is that Madeline Walker became a part of this community. She joined this church and she met women like Jessie Batch Robinson, who was a leader of the Mike Missionary Society. She was a club woman in the National Association of Colored Women. She was very connected, very engaged, speaking truth to power in local St. Louis about the, the dangers and strictures of, of Jim Crow. And she and, and Madam Walker, or Sarah at this point, became very good friends. And in fact, Jesse takes her under her wing and supports her and helps her get on her feet. And so it's important to understand Madam Walker. You've got to understand Jesse Batch Robinson as a generous woman, a leader and an activist who's modeling these behaviors for Sarah. And later in life, Madam Walker reflects back upon this period in her life during an interview. And she says it was during this time in St. Louis that she learned it was her responsibility to help others and to uplift the race. There also was fraternal women as another network that helped to produce Madam C.J. Walker. Well, it turns out that Jesse Batch Robinson was a leader in a private secret society fraternal order called the Order of the Court of Calanthe. And she brought young Sarah into that and, and eventually Madam Walker became a member. And so the Court of Calanthe was a Christian group dedicated to charity. Uh, it was mostly comprised of women, though there were some male members, and they would actively do good works in the community. And in fact, they had three different levels of ritual degrees that one would progress through and to get promoted through. And in order to do those, you had to do community-based projects. And so again, another network that's very important because the Calanthians also had a weekly due structure. So they paid money into the pot. And from that pot, they would pay out social insurance when people got into trouble and got sickness or illness. Uh, and certainly when people um, lost a loved one, uh, that those funds will be used to provide burial services. And so another generous network, a philanthropic resource of, of civically engaged uh, and, and, and very compassionate people that's important to understand for Madam Walker's story. 
So then that leads us to the final group, the Walker agents themselves. When Madam Walker stood up her company, she began recruiting Black women to sell her products. Um, and several years into that process, she began to recognize the power of women when you bring them together to do something. And so she went out to her agents and she told them, it's not enough for you to sell these products, but you have to engage in the struggle for freedom. So she began organizing them into Walker clubs around the country. I was able to find about 50 of them. Uh, and, and in those clubs, she told them uh, to, to engage. And there's all these reports in the archive where the clubs are, are, are letting Walker know that they have donated money to a local Black college. They've given furniture to a local organization. They participated in a protest march for the NAACP against lynching. They, they were actively engaged. They took it very seriously. And, and it kind of culminates uh, when uh, at their early convention in 1917, 1918, they had a lot of political conversations about anti-lynchings. And they developed a, a, a letter that they sent to President Woodrow Wilson in Washington, D.C., demanding uh, protections for Black life against lynchings. So these women saw themselves as political agents and as philanthropic agents invested in freedom in their, for their people and not just merely uh, selling products uh, to make a living. So understanding these is very important because I believe today a multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural America is standing up and saying to the professional worlds of philanthropy and fundraising, much like Madam Walker did to Booker T. Washington, Washington, that when it comes to philanthropy and generosity, we too are unlike our dear white brothers and sisters who get most of the attention, who are the ones that are always painted as philanthropists and we're painted as recipients. So no, we give too. We always have and we continue to do so. We've been on the front lines of the freedom struggle and we continue today and we see that now with the pandemic and the ways in which the movement for Black Lives and other movements have, have gotten stronger and forced the world's attention to these issues of injustice. That's a big part of this deep history of philanthropic engagement and matter Adam Walker gives us access to it. This is why I've been challenging that field and in writing pieces in, in, in recent years to say to the, to the field and to fundraisers that no, African-Americans are not new to philanthropy. It didn't start with Robert F. Fitt, uh, Smith or Oprah Winfrey, that this giving, this engagement, this care and concern for community and for others goes back to the very beginning of the African-American experience. And it's a deep part of what has made America and what promises to help America reach its ideal. And so it's important, again, to think about African-Americans not as the recipients of other people's philanthropy, but as agents of their own generosity uh, who've helped each other, helped themselves, and in the process have helped to make America better and to hold it more true to its promise for all people. And so just to give you a quick sense of some of the landscape of this generosity and how it plays out today, um, I have a model here that I write about in the book where I talk about different ways that African-Americans give and engage today. If we start at 12 o'clock, there are still kinship and community-based forms of giving where people are giving friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor, uh, family member to family member. This type of mutual aid was very important during the pandemic because the government system failed and people didn't know how uh, what was happening or how they were going to take care of themselves. So they relied upon each other. Lots of people looking out for each other, sharing food, driving food across town, driving medicine, looking after people. Those are parts of this deep tradition of giving engaging, and, and engaging. And of course, there are high net worth African-Americans who use the tools of wealth to create institutions like family foundations uh, or use donor advised funds where they can fund scholarships or, or medical research or other areas that are important. At the six o'clock uh, spot, there are giving circles. Uh, you may have seen these recently in the news, but giving circles have become very popular in America over the past 20 years. The, the basic idea is that a group of people come together, they decide on an amount, each person pays that amount into an account, and then collectively that sum is redistributed to organizations that are pursuing goals that align with the members of the group. African Americans and Black women in particular have been flocking to giving circles uh, because of the ways in which it allows them to give collectively and to amplify their gifts uh, to invest in their communities. There are also infrastructure and capacity building organizations, most familiar the UNCF that has been raising money for Black colleges for generations, and there are identity-based networks like Blacks and philanthropy groups all over the country, Hispanics in philanthropy, Native Americans in philanthropy, where people are standing up, claiming themselves as philanthropists, and engaging in the kinds of capacity-building work that helps Black-led and Black-funded organizations become stronger in pursuing their work. So there's a rich landscape of Black philanthropy that reflects this rich history that Madam Walker gives us access to. And so when we can understand this, we not only see and understand Madam Walker in a different way, as more than the first self-made female millionaire, more than the business mogul, but as this generous woman to the core, she also helps us see the terrain of Black giving today. And so understanding her story helps us understand 
Oprah Winfrey. I believe it's a mistake to think of Miss Winfrey as kind of a, a black Andrew Carnegie or, or today's black Olivia Sage. But Miss Winfrey has said that her, her connection and engagement and commitment to education and giving came from her grandmother, who was a church woman and a club woman, very much in this Walker tradition. And we know that Miss Winfrey uses her business to uh, integrate philanthropy into her daily life, much in the way that Madam C.J. Walker did. But of course, Ms. Winfrey is in kind of a, at a level all her own, uh, right? But this, this tradition and philanthropy is not only about what the wealthy do with their extreme riches. This is about the everyday givers, like my mother, Carolyn Cooper Freeman, who was the first lady of a church in New Jersey where I grew up. Not a millionaire by any stretch of imagination, but generous to the core, very engaged, always chairing committees and running programs and helping others formally and informally, uh, very much indicative of this rich tradition and probably sounds familiar to some of the women in your family and your community. There are also groups like SPIN, the Sisterhood of Philanthropists Impacting Needs, which is a Black women's giving circle based in Denver, Colorado. And these women each collectively pool $400 per year into the pot, and they, they decide and give those out to organizations that are pursuing racial and gender justice in their community. There are groups like DAP, Denver African American Philanthropists, a men's philanthropy group that is doing very much it's very similar work. There's the Young Black and Giving Back Institute based in Washington, D.C., uh, where a group of black and brown millennials came together and were very frustrated by the lack of attention that they received compared to their white peers. They said, that, hey, we are engaging, we're giving, and we need a space where we can talk about these issues. And so this institute regularly puts on conferences and trainings to help um, emerging black millennials think about their giving over time and the philanthropic legacies that they want to build and how they're invested in the ongoing struggle for freedom. Uh, there are groups like the Divine Nine the nine historic legacy Greek letter, African-American sororities and fraternities, all of them founded during Madam Walker's lifetime, all of them steeped in and grounded in philanthropy and each has their own philanthropic initiative that they advance every year. This happens to be a picture of the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha uh, Sorority Incorporated and they are in the middle of a $10 million campaign where they're giving endowments of $100,000 or more to every single HBCU in the country. And there are 100 HBCUs. And as I said, all of the Divine Nine do this uh, on a regular basis. Again, this philanthropy is everywhere, is right under our noses. And of course, uh, we, we would be remiss if we didn't connect the Me Too movement to this tradition, right? Me Too was not founded by white Hollywood actresses, but by this black woman, Tarana Burke, who's again coming out of this Walker tradition where Madam Walker was on the front lines of the struggle for women's voting rights. And here today, uh, Sister Tarana is challenging us to think about women uh, and their needs uh, and how to, how to address injustices based on sexism and gender. Uh, and of course, the three founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, Black women coming out of this tradition, much as Madam Walker was on the front lines of the anti-lynching movement 100 years ago, right? It's no accident that Black women are leading the charge in this movement today. And the reason why August has been designated as Black Philanthropy Month is because of these three generous Black women. In the green, Dr. Jackie Copeland. Uh, in the blue hat, uh, Valeda Fullwood, who's a leader in the Giving Circles movement. And in the black, Tracy Webb, who's a leader in the digital Black philanthropy movement. Uh, they came together and named August as, as Black Philanthropy Month in order to celebrate the joy uh, and the legacy of generosity that pervades a Black culture wherever it is on this uh, this earth. And so again, lots of everyday examples of how this generosity is alive and well. We are not only recipients, we are agents of this tradition. We have been from the beginning, and it's important to recognize this. And so uh, understanding Madam Walker as we prepare to close and enter into conversation, we get to see and, and engage Madam Walker from a different perspective, an accomplished entrepreneur, um, an accomplished someone who, did, who developed untold wealth that, that Black folks hadn't seen before, uh, but there's more to it, that she was a, a generous philanthropist to the core, and important to understand that dynamic. And so if anything, she teaches us that philanthropy is not about wealth, but it's about uh, generosity, right? And generosity is not about the size of your bank account, but it's about your heart. And since philanthropy itself comes from the Greek word love of mankind, it may be that love is the greatest gift uh, that we have to give of all. And so thank you very much for your time. I'm excited uh, to have been here with you today and look forward to the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. That was an amazing slide deck. I learned a lot, a oh, lot. I thought, I thought I knew some stuff, but I learned a lot from that. And I'm sure everyone that's watching from the thank comfort you. of their home, their offices, they learned a lot as well. So 
at this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Freeman a few questions. We're just going to open dialogue and you all can message us on YouTube and we will get the questions over here and I will ask your questions. Also, if you're joining us here on the Zoom platform, you can message your question here as well. So the first question I have, it may be silly, it may sound silly, but do you know why Sarah decided to change her name to Madam C.J. Walker? Oh, yeah, no, it's not silly at all. Um, and I, I kind of referenced it a little bit. It, she married a man named Charles Joseph Walker, who was this kind of the salesman, this, this marketer. Um, and, and, and so when she's beginning to kind of set up the company, she's married to him and begins developing this idea. And so um, he's an early partner in helping her get into newspapers and other things. So that's the idea. And then the, the Madam piece is something borrowed from the larger um, field of beauty culture, something that was common in, in France in particular, but that women would take on that moniker as a sign of, of respectability, as a sign of, of being serious in this. And so it just kind of came together. And, and the truly revolutionary thing is for her to put her face and her name on the products because we weren't really seeing that before she really took the leap and began doing that. Got it. And a follow-up to that. Yeah. So Charles was her second or third husband? Third. Third husband. Yeah. Did she change her name to take on those other failed marriages? their names and then this happened to be another change or was it Sarah and then she went to Madam C.J. Walker? Um, she Well, she was, um, um, the, the first husband was uh, McWilliams, Moses McWilliams. And so she did go by Sarah McWilliams for a time. Um, and the second one was Davis. Um, so so uh, it appears that she did uh, kind of change the names um, over time. Oh, good. All right, thank you. All right, a question we have here is, so gospel of giving, what does that term actually mean and what is the significance of that when it comes to black history yeah thank you so so one there's a couple of things that i'm doing with that title one i'm kind of i'm taking a jab at andrew carnegie <laughs> a little bit, because he's known for this idea of, of, of the gospel of wealth. Now, it based, is based on an essay that he wrote in 1889, which was only titled Wealth, but over time it became known as the gospel of wealth in terms of this is how you should do philanthropy. And in it, he explains that as, as someone who has generated a lot of wealth, he has a responsibility to give back. And so he's really concerned with, well, what am I supposed to do with all this money? And so he lists several different areas that he thinks it's, it's, it's effective and efficient to give money. And since that was so consequential that, again, so many philanthropists since then have, have looked to him and looked to that model to inform what they do. And so, one, I'm, I'm saying, well, look, this is not a gospel of wealth, but this is a gospel of giving. That, that giving has nothing to do with wealth, right? For Carnegie, it did. This is why he's, he's, he's concerned about these questions. What am I going to do with all this money? Madam Walker wasn't concerned about what to do with all this money. She knew what to do with it because she had already been doing it. She needed freedom just like the average Black person back in that time. So she dedicated herself and her life to giving and engaging along the way. And so I wanted to articulate it in a way that would be familiar to people in the world of philanthropy, but also that would challenge back against this dominant view and philosophy of what philanthropy is, who does it, and how it should work, because there's many different ways to give. It doesn't belong to one group or one kind of person. It's part of our common collective human heritage. And so that's the one thing I wanted to position that contrast and understand Madam Walker on her own terms and not, not in terms of other models. But then the other thing that I'm doing there is lifting up the role of the Black church in shaping this amongst uh, within her, um, and especially the, the role of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She was born into a Baptist family, but then converted to African Methodist Episcopal. Um, and, and so this is important because that church was on the front lines of the struggle as well. Um, and, and so it was building schools and supporting agencies, and it had an international sense about itself and was doing work in Africa and building schools and, 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 and congregations. And so it was when, when, when Sarah became connected with the AME church, she was exposed to a whole new way of thinking and a whole new world where Black people were running things and Black people owned the building and, and had their own educational programs and doing things. These were things that she wasn't seeing in that small little town of Delta, Louisiana. So it very much is noting the role of Christianity, of Black Christianity, the Black social gospel in shaping her. And it also is a critique of the dominant models of philanthropy that don't explain anything about Black generosity, but are Frequently, but black generosity is frequently forced into that mold or looked through looked at through that lens. So I wanted to correct that and help to give people the right lenses for looking at this tradition on its own terms. 
Thank you, thank you. And the AME church that you're speaking about is when she was in St. Louis, correct? Yes, that's when she um, uh, that's when she co uh, converted. And whenever she moved, she lived in several different cities across her lifetime. And one of the first things she would do would be connect with the local AME church. So in Denver and Pittsburgh, Indianapolis, uh, she she connected with local uh, um, AME con uh, congregations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. So another question we have here is. So you wrote throughout history, African Americans have pursued education as a prime aspiration. As a resource that had been both denied and pursued, education represented a linchpin for securing hope for individuals and freedom for the race. Walker's own philanthropic pursuits reflect the aspirations, including her support of Tuskegee Institute and desire to establish schools in Africa. Why was education so important to Madam C.J. Walker? Wow. Well, so one, there's this issue of proximity that's important to understand that every gift that Madam Walker gave was one she once needed herself or one she continued to need. Right. And so as, as you imagine, as a young child in Delta, Louisiana, and then later in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Right. There were no formal uh, provisions for her education. Right. So she was unschooled. Right. And so it was as an adult that she began to educate herself, again, using these black institutions because Jim Crow was denying her that opportunity. So she had a very close connection. She knew the implications of not being able to go to school. So she tried to open up pathways so others wouldn't have to suffer that. She also knew the struggles of being a washerwoman and trying to take care of her daughter. Um, and, and one of the common things that would happen to black washerwomen is that they would, they would gather up their clients' clothing and then do it. And at the end of the week, when they would go return it, in many cases, many of their white clients would not pay them or would give them half of, half of what they were supposed to. So there are a lot of economic injustices that she was very familiar with. She knew the struggle of trying to feed her daughter and where, where was that going to come from? So for her later to then create this company that then produced jobs that allowed people to have that kind of stability, right? That's, again, that's that proximity. That's that lived experience coming through and guiding her. And we see that across that whole thing. So this is why education was particularly important for her. And if we step back and look at the broader history, this is why education has been a key in, 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 in American history for African-Americans, because it was something that was specifically denied us. It was illegal to teach the enslaved to read, right? Um, and yet they strive, they strive to learn how to read nonetheless. And then when all the struggles surrounding segregated schools or not providing schools, right, we know um, the lengths to which Black people went to get educated and what that meant. And so education has been a fundamental part of this struggle. And even today, as we look at the plight of urban schools, the plight of rural schools, right, that's the next iteration of this longstanding value for education that Black people have had and the ways in which they've used their own resources, again, to speak truth to power and try to get the best that they can for their children. Thank you. So speaking about education and truth, <laughs> could you talk about the comparison of the Netflix series to her actual live life, the validity of it? Because I know that's been popular. It was um, a lot of people tuned in because we were in the middle of a pandemic and a lot right. of people, we've always known about Madam C.J. Walker, but she came back. And, you know, we, we love drama. We love what they put out. We love the production. We appreciate seeing Black faces on the screen. Yeah. But was truthful to what her lived experiences were. Yeah, no, I, I remember it vividly. Um, in fact, here in Indianapolis, we have the Madam C.J. Walker Legacy Center, which was the headquarters for her company. And it's a theater where they frequently have events. And we were planning to do a launch event. And, and we had not been told yet, but, but stars from the cast were supposed to come to Indianapolis. But that week is when the shutdowns happened. So the event had to get canceled. Uh, so we were all ready for it, but we did some things on Twitter anyway. But no, so here, here's the thing, right? So, so Hollywood has a certain thing that it's trying to accomplish in, in taking these stories out and connecting with uh, contemporary audiences. And so generally speaking, the overall arc of the story that they told was, was very true and from, the, from the plantation to the mansion and, and, and building this company. Uh, along the way, uh, there, there's great creative license and, ex and expression in terms of how they shaped where she was, what she was doing, who she was doing with. A lot of the char characters were, were created um, that, that did not actually exist in her life, uh, but some of them may have reflected larger practices or, or situations going Going on in the culture. For instance, um, Annie Munro, uh, there was a woman named Annie M Malone who did indeed hire young Sarah to work for her hair, cur hair care company, um, but she was not a very fair-skinned woman and there was not this kind of colorism and cultural politics between the two of them, though those things existed, right? Um, and is it a part of the story if you think about beauty culture and Black women's aesthetic and what, the, what, what, what counts as beautiful and, and those kinds of things. So uh, a lot of creative license. I think it's important to, to think about, though, it, it introduced a whole new 
generation of Adam C.J. Walker. A whole new pe- generation of people are familiar with her now. Um, some want to learn more and read more and, and, and go to her archives. So those archives that I use, for instance, they're all digitized. So um, they weren't, when I started doing this work, I had to go through by hand, but now your, your, your viewers can log in and look at the same letters I looked at, um, right? So there's a greater interest and attention to who she was and what she represented and her peers, right? Uh, she came in contact with other uh, prominent figures in our history. And so um, uh, it introduced a lot of people to her, which I think is a good thing. We have a question from Chris, I think. Yeah. He's going to- um, thanks, Dr. Bruce. And, and thanks for your presentation, Dr. Freeman. I, Thank you. Uh, I did have a question. So you talked a lot about Madam C.J. Walker and her basic, her fight for education, whether it's history or reading and writing. And then you talked about how um, from for generation to generation, they try to improve upon that, giving more um, opportunities to Black Americans. You have the rise of HBCUs and everything like that. Put Madam C.J. Walker in today's landscape where there's efforts across the country to kind of change what we're learning about in history based on our own responses, our own sensitivity. I, be- I think you, you know maybe know what I'm talking about, how uh, like, for example, critical race theory, we're, we're trying to change some of the things that we've been learning about based on how some people want history to be perceived. What would Madam C.J. Walker do in an instance like today when the history and the education that she fought for is kind of being held captive almost to what some people might call a, a, a modern day Jim Crow? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, no, I, I, you know, she, she reflects this deep, rich history, right, which is very much part of the American story, but it gets swept under the rug, it gets overlooked, it doesn't get valued. Um, but but there's so much that we can learn from her. And, and I think that she would be speaking up about the, these injustices just as she was then. Um, so Black Lives Matter would feel very familiar to her because she was, you know, part of the anti-lynching movement, which was that generation's version of Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, the, the, Me Too would sound familiar to her, because uh, washerwomen live with the daily threat of rape, right, and 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 and, and potential vulnerability as women, um, as well as kind of not being paid fairly and, and respected in their communities and on the job. And so I, I, she was, you know, very much a part of these uh, movements then and would be now. And so I think um, as someone who valued education, as someone who read voraciously, um, you know, one, there's an interview with one of her employees from the 1980s who who talked about um, how uh, one of the first things Madam Walker would do each morning was come into the office and read the newspaper. And if she didn't know a word or understand what it meant, that she would circle it and just ask the closest person around her, can you tell me what this word meant? Not, not ashamed, not embarrassed that she didn't know, right? But someone who's trying to improve and, and recognizing that there's things that she doesn't know. So she surrounded herself with people who did know so that collectively they could build something together. And so I think that that, that ethos, that idea is, is very important um, and, and, and it would be something that she would still be living out um, to this day as, as kind of just the latest iteration of the ongoing struggle for freedom. Awesome. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, Chris, are there any questions from the YouTube page? Um, none that have come in so far. Um, I, 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 I had one, another question to add, if, if that's all right. Uh, yeah. So you, you yourself went to an HBCU. Mm-hmm. Um, it looks like 2021 had some really big moments in the life of HBCU universities. We had you know, especially in athletics, like the number one football recruit decided to choose Jackson State over some of the bigger schools. You had the first ever HBCU championship bowl game. Uh, so what I guess is the importance of the, that type of publicity for, um, you know, modern day black history and how can how do you think that could impact you know, future fundraising efforts or future, you know, educational outreach efforts. So, so basically what I'm trying to say is a lot of these newer things dealing with HBCUs and, and they're, they're starting to have a spotlight upon them. So how important is that in addition to the, the money that's rolling in with, with fundraising? Um, those things are, are important because it speaks to the longstanding contributions that HBCUs have made. Um, and it's, you know, generation after generation. Um, and so it's important to recognize that. And it, it points to their the continuing need for them. 
that they are educating and reaching uh, people who get left behind uh, the larger system of higher education, um, but also provide, you know, some of them, you know, some of the HBCUs uh, are leaders in producing Black people who graduate with STEM degrees, uh, who go into medicine, engineering, and other fields. These type of accomplishments have always been there and been the bedrock of what HBCUs do. And there's also some other things that have come to light along with that. You know, in recent years, we've also seen uh, in the state of Tennessee, for instance, as well as in Maryland, um, we've seen um, uh, acknowledgement that the state higher education systems have not funded them fairly, have withheld funds uh, based on discrimination from the Jim Crow era uh, and the various ways that the formulas that are used are, are, just, are inequitable. Um, and, and I believe it's over half a billion dollars that the state of Tennessee acknowledged it's owed to Tennessee State and the other Black HBCUs um, in, that, in that state. The same thing in Maryland, uh, right? So th there's a longstanding history of really starving these institutions uh, that grows out of this history of slavery and Jim Crow. And, and it's hard to come back from that. It's a struggle. Um, HBCUs are known for kind of making a way out of no way. And this is part of that, that there were, there were people who took funding away from them just because they were Black organizations. And we're grappling with that now. This is why uh, the, the recent gifts by Mackenzie Scott, the, uh, the billionaire Mackenzie Scott, uh, to organizations, including several HBCUs, I believe it was over 25 HBCUs, she gave multi-million dollar gifts um, over the past two years. Um, and she gave it to them with no strings attached. She's, and, and from $4 million all the way up to $50 million for Prairie View in Texas. And she said, you guys do whatever you need to do with this money because you know far better than I do. That's part of an effort to, to compensate for this history of discrimination where funds were deliberately withdrawn or withheld from these institutions and made their task that much harder. So you're right, this kind of publicity Anything that gets people closer to HBCUs and understands their ongoing contributions, not just their great history, I think are very good and can be leveraged to support uh, public awareness campaigns, fundraising campaigns, capital campaigns, and other things. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. I'm done with my question list. I don't know, Dr. Dixon, you are still here. Thank you, Chris, for your two questions. Um, Dr. Freeman, is there anything? Oh, there's. I am still here. I was just kind of listening in the background. I, I do actually have another question. I mean, um, you know, we before we started the, the actual live stream, we were having some conversation about, you know, why this is so important. And Kevon and myself, our co-chairs at, at Edinburgh's campus, you know, the FDI initiative, which is the Frederick Douglass Initiative, is something that's established across the Apache schools in Pennsylvania. And one of our goals is to really help students develop a sense around social justice and around how they, uh, about how they can be impactful. So there's a number of different initiatives like the debate and the conference that we hold, encouraging research and, you know, that discovery process that you even talked about it. But I'm just going back to in the time period that we're living in, you know, one of the comments you mentioned earlier, Dr. Freeman, was that <clears throat> it's so important to understand the shared history and why this rich history is important to all of us. And so I'm thinking about particularly, you know, the students and the faculty members at, at the university who may be listening to this, particularly those educators, those emerging educators, um, how, how this is important to not only their history, but how they can carry this into the classroom um, in a way that is understanding the larger picture here? How can they embed this? Why should they embed this in their curriculum? Can you just speak to that a little bit? I know you touched on it, but um, talk about that in terms of why this rich shared history can be so important, I think, particularly to educators. Yeah, um, because it's American history, right? It's our collective history. Um, just because there's a focus on it in February, it doesn't mean we should not return to it the other 11 months of the, of the year. We should be constantly engaged in it because you can understand uh, big questions about America by looking at African-American philanthropy. What is democracy? What is citizenship? What does it mean? Who gets to determine who a citizen is or isn't? Uh, what does it mean to be patriotic? Madam Walker supported World War I. Right, as did many African Americans of that generation, hoping that by supporting the war and by going overseas and fighting for rights that they did not have secured for themselves, that America would turn around and then grant them those rights. And it didn't. And yet, Black people showed up for the next World War. 
And after that war, those those rights were not, you know, were not granted, but they showed up and they kept, they've been there, right? African-Americans have fought in every single conflict that this country has had, right? And so when you want to think about uh, patriotism, wow, look at Black history, right? And look at the ways in which they've contributed to the society. And so I think it's important and it gives us ways of understanding uh, the way things have unfolded, um, who has contributed to this, 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 this collective story of this country that we're building. And I think it's also important uh, for the students, right? To have a sense. We, we, we can't have a situation where, again, um, it's just the usual, the usual names, uh, the Martin Luther Kings um, and the Rosa Parks, and then that's it. And now we might add pr- uh, President Obama and Michelle Obama, right? But there's so much that from the beginning of this country to the present uh, that we need to engage and that everyone needs to become conversant with. This is why there's a section in the, at the end of the book where I talk about the um, Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture which is a beautiful facility in in Washington, D.C. Um, It tells the story from day one, going back to Africa before the encounter, uh, before slavery, right? And and, and all the culture that that the enslaved brought with them and how that is transformed over time and how that transformed America to the very present. And so that is a gift to the entire country. Um, That's important that for all of us to understand that. And so um, institutions like that give us tools and, and, and exhibits and things that we can draw into our teaching. I hope that, you know, thinking about Madeline Walker as a philanthropist will challenge some of the teachers in your network to think about ways of, of, of a to- approaching that subject with their students. But again, this is our collective history. Um, and students should be able to see themselves reflected in that history because they have contributed to it, right? Um, they've been written out. Um, but they've always been there. And so this book that I've written was very much about writing people back into the history of philanthropy because they're already there. It's just that the people that have been writing this history to date haven't been focused on them. So I wanted to sh- shine the spotlight on them as are other scholars and other people in this space. And so I think it's very important to keep doing that, keep shining the light, keep telling the truth, keep telling the story because we've all contributed uh, to this country and to this world. And that should be understood uh, by everyone as well. Thank you so much. You know, as you were talking, part, you know, both Kavan and I, again, we're in the counseling program. And so, you know, even thinking about that from a historical perspective, great point that this, we should not just think about Black history or our history uh, one time of year, but how it's integrated throughout. But it does, you know, raise, you know, you think about the works that Madam C.J. Walker did and others in her time being very, very forward in her thinking and, um, you know, really being a trailblazer. But the psyche that was going on, I mean, to be in that position and to have that level of boldness and impact, you know, the psyche on the the African-American community and just thinking about even nowadays, you know, for me, I'm just thinking, you know, how that has a role and how people, um, their development, our young people, you know, all of us in terms of how we see ourselves. And um, I'm just, you know, when you started out the the contrast to W. Um, e. Du Bois and his, you know, his classic work on, you know, the souls of Black folks and just thinking about that this is, is much deeper than just even the actions in our rich history, but it also speaks to our identity and how we see ourselves, how others see us. And um, particularly in these unprecedented times, what that means is we're seeing some of the other challenges around social justice and um, the disparities to, you know, communities of color in particular. Yeah. So um, I guess that's not really a question, just like a commentary that it really just, uh, I think, resonated again of why this is so important, why it's vital. It doesn't just touch one element, one domain about educating people but how we integrate this um, and that we're able to um, preserve this rich heritage but also embrace it in a way that teaches us lessons of how we can glean from um, her acts and the acts of others like her during her time frame how do we continue to carry on that legacy and respond to it which is again our mission at the fdi um, collaborative. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Freeman, for sharing with us and for um, helping us to kind of re-examine um, the, the history that we have, particularly through Madam C.J. Walker. And I know you and I at one point um, had the opportunity to talk about the fact that even from a regional perspective, she lived in Pittsburgh at one point. And so we have some regional geographical connection to her just being in this area. So yeah. thank you again, 
for sharing. Thank you for sharing your works and for, for taking on this task so that we could have this wonderful piece of work to hold on to and to be able to uh, have a better understanding of who she was yeah. well, well beyond just, you know, uh, an entrepreneur or her giving, but that she really has had an impact on who we are as um, a culture of Americans and our rich history. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Kavan Bruce for moderating and certainly a shout Shout out to um, Crystal Buria for being our uh, background and helping to navigate today's forum. I, I do a lot of these presentations. This is probably one of my favorites. I'm going to actually go back in there and watch watch it. I'm going to read the book and I'm going to take notes on the Netflix special. I'm going to do a little personal contrast and comparing project. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you present at the next conference. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. We hope that you will share with us again on our FDI initiatives um, and that you will take the opportunity to use this time to reflect, not to uh, be settled into just Black history this day, but to look at our rich history across many different cultures and groups um, and, and take the opportunity to learn more and be able to embrace that identity.